Thank you very much, and um, it's a pleasure to be here uh, to speak to you today, and particularly to uh, team up once again with a longtime collaborator, Richard Abbott, for a, a Senecio double bill this <laughs> afternoon. Um, so I think I'll start with a poem that I think is particularly apt for this meeting and the plant that I'm going to talk about. They won't let the railways alone, those yellow flowers. They're that remorseless joy of dereliction, darkest banks exhale like vivid breath as bricks divide to let, root, let them root between. How every falling place concocts their smile, taking what's left and making a song of it. And that um, is a poem about the Oxford ragwort. And um, it has um, glorified many derelict places over the years, not least bomb sites during and after the war, along with Budlier and Rose Bay, Willow Herb. And um, it's an important element of our native flora here in the UK and um, the type specimen was actually described um, from material collected in Oxford um, by Linnaeus. And also relevant to um, this meeting is this um, sort of thing that people have been doing in urban environments um, in various parts of the UK and, and in Europe, actually writing the names of um, urban weeds, if you like, flowers that grow in urban areas on the pavement or on rocks or bits of detritus so that the people that walk past them can, I, can know the name of the plant that they're perhaps about to tread on. And this highlights a, a project in Deptford um, a few years ago um, called the Tagwort Project, where they went round actually writing the names of, of, of these um, urban plants on the pavement so that people could see them. And it's particularly popular in Holland as well. Colleagues at the um, Botanic Garden at Leiden have done a lot of this in Leiden and, and Amsterdam, and there's even a little book that they've written about it to encourage other um, urban areas to do the same. So something you might consider up here in, in, in Edinburgh, particularly for the young as well. So my talk today is, is really focused purely uh, on uh, Oxford ragwort, Senecio squalidus, um, as, as a prelude, in effect, to Richard's talk on some of the consequences of um, its activities, um, sexual activities here in the, um, in the UK. And I'll split the talk into to five sections. So early records and history, um, Sicilian origins, um, invasive success, because it's an extremely successful um, invasive species, um, some recent genomic insights that we've, um, we, we've achieved, and then finally, um, the place where it originated. So early records um, were sort of all gathered together um, by Claridge Druce um, in the, the floor of Oxfordshire, which he published and revised over a number of years, first published in 18. 86, and gradually through those different editions, the um, sort of um, romantic story of the Oxford ragwort was developed by Druce, which culminated in the um, 1927 uh, edition, where he waxes very lyrical about this plant and its ability to <coughs> spread. So the first edition of the flora, he he, he, he gathered together um, most of the available records, particularly those available in Oxford, 
um, in the herbarium because he was the curator of the Oxford herbaria for many years. And um, he describes the, um, uh, the, the, the way that Linnaeus um, got seeds from Delenius in the 1730s and then um, described this new species, Senecio squalidus, uh, the type specimen in 1753. However, the first definitive record of Senecio squalidus um, is really Sibthorpe's record of 1794. Um, and there's a specimen in the uh, Sherardian herbarium at Oxford, uh, dated 1799. Um, and this reference, he starts to build on this, 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 this idea of the escape from the Oxford Botanic Garden where it was um, grown and spreading into the walls of, of old colleges and buildings around Oxford and becoming quite um, naturalised in Oxford at the end of the 1700s. And then he moots this, he posits this Sicilian origin that, that was first um, mentioned in, in it by Smith in uh, 1825. And he, he then goes on to say uh, the name Squalidus is very, is very, is very inappropriate and the, the name Senecio chrysanthemifolius is, is more fitting and that will become more relevant as, as we go on. But he then says it's very variable, um, which is another important point for later. Then in the um, 1927 account, this is where he really gets going and devotes quite a lot of words, paragraphs, pages to the Oxford, Oxford ragwort. Um, and he then makes a very bold statement in, in saying that the, um, the, the Oxford ragwort was cultivated before 1699, and he uses um, reference material in the herbaria of, 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 of Dubois um, at Oxford and um, a Morrison um, description uh, in Oxford as well to make this point that it, 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 it came to Oxford um, from Sicily in the, um, in, in the, early, the late 1600s, early 1700s. But notice the uh, reference to chrysanthemy again here. Um, and he highlights that the monk Bocconi was probably responsible for sending seeds to um, Jacob Bobart, the younger, um, at that time. And then he starts waxing lyrical about the spread of the Oxford ragwort, um, the clinker beds of the railway lines as the Industrial Revolution gets going, Oxford's railway system expanded, um, and this provided the environments like on Mount Etna, where it came from, so he says, and, um, and spread all over the country and gets on a, a train in Oxford and then exits at Tilehurst with a, <laughs> with a seed and so on and so forth. And so that's really the Oxford ragwort story embellished um, and developed by Druce. And of course the spread was incredibly well document documented by Kent in numerous papers um, cr cr um, uh, as a chronology of this, this spread. And I think it got to um, Oxford and Edinburgh in the 1950s and 60s. And of course, this is uh, 2010. It's, it's since spread quite a bit into urban areas here and, of course, in Ireland and, and, and Northern Ireland. And now I'll move on to the, the Sicilian origins. Um, as I said, first proposed by Smith um, and then um, expanded by Crisp, um, who proposed that the um, native UK Senecio squalidus was derived from hybrid material named Senecio incisus, which is a hybrid found on Mount Etna 
um, between this um, high elevation species, Senecio etnensis, which is endemic to Mount Etna, and Senecio chrysanthemifolius, um, which is native to uh, lower elevations on Etna. And as you can see, they look uh, rather, rather similar, uh, especially Senecio chrysanthemifolius and Senecio squalidus. Um, Etnensis is, is, has, has very different leaves, as we'll see. And um, James and Abbott, and I'll come on to them in a minute, this just summarises the, um, the, the, the dynamics of that Mount Etna system. So we have uh, Etnensis, which the, the pure form typically is found above 2,500 metres, and the pure form of Chrysanthemifolius um, below 700. And then there's this long hybrid zone that you get where you can see um, intermediate forms. And notice it's a, a diploid hybrid, so it hasn't changed the chromosome number of the parents. So they're very closely related, and the hybrid is, of course, fertile. So, um, PhD student supervised by Richard Abbott tested, they tested this um, Sicilian hypothesis and did a transect on Mount Etna. And you can see here clearly the clinal distribution of leaves from pure um, Senecio etnensis, which has more or less entire leaves, um, to the um, very um, indented leaves, divided leaves of, of Senecio chrysanthemifolius. And that cline in leaf form was matched by a cline in uh, molecular markers that, um, diagnostic markers that they developed for each of the parental species. Um, and as you can see here, you're in the lower, lower elevations with, with fairly pure chrysanthemifolius and up here, pure etnensis, and then you've got this, this area of hybridization. So it's, it's quite clear that there's hybridization there. And when you look at the composition of UK Senecio squalidus with the same markers in uh, six different locations, you can see that quite clearly um, the UK Senecio squalidus is a hybrid between these two species. And interestingly, the composition of these uh, diagnostic markers is approximately 70-30 chrysanthemifolius etnensis. Um, so that's an interesting point to remember as we go through. So what about the invasive success? Um, well, I don't think it's um, uh, any... any, um, any incident that um, puts the Asteraceae as, as being a very successful invasive group. John um, uh, highlighted a number of Asteraceae species that have become successful invasives, and a lot of this is due to their very unique reproductive biology, uh, in that they produce flower heads, capitula, with masses of tiny flowers. Um, in Senecio squalidus, around about 80 uh, florets per capitulum, and then that results in, in, in many seeds as well, or fruits, achenes. So there's extremely um, <coughs> large amounts of reproductive potential there, but most Asteraceae um, have or have had um, self-incompatibility. And what we found in, in UK Senecio squalidus is, is what we've called a flexibility within that um, very strongly um, genetically determined self-incompatibility system. So a little more about this. Um, self-incompatibility in, in, in Senecio squalidus is under... Um, sporophytic control, as it is in all the rest of the Asteraceae that have been looked at, and this occurs in uh, Brassicaceae as well and others, 
which means that the pollen is under uh, is is the the, the, the Phenotype, the self incompatibility phenotype of the pollen is determined by the parent plant. So it can be, it behaves with a diploid phenotype, which means that dominance interactions can happen, which makes the genetics of sporophytic SI very complicated. Um, but what we found with um, Senecio is that there's a tendency for low levels of self-seed set, even within this um, self-incompatibility system. And we also, we call that pseudo-self-compatibility. And what we also found in UK uh, Oxford Ragwood is that there's very few S alleles that control the incompatibility system and, you, and compared to other populations with sporophytic SI and other SI systems, but with unusually high levels of dominance um, compared to other, other species. And what dominance does is it can increase compatibility um, compared to um, co-dominance, and I'll come on to that in a minute. Um, all these mating system studies um, were, were not done with molecular markers because we still don't know the, gene the, the absolute um, genes and molecules that are controlling this. So they were all done through um, crossing diallels, reciprocal pollinations with um, tens of plants per population where you look for compatibility, incompatibility or um, slightly intermediate. And these, these painstaking studies were done by myself and um, particularly um, a PhD student um, and then postdoc Adrian Brennan. And this is him as a fresh faced undergraduate doing his um, undergraduate project in, with me in Oxford um, back in 1999. This is him after he'd worked for me for a few years, and particularly working in a greenhouse with this, um, this, this Oxford ragwort, and you, the more you work with it in an enclosed environment, you become allergic. So poor old Adrian, he was very allergic to this plant by the time he'd finished his studies. And what did he do afterwards? He went and did a postdoc with Richard Abbott, so <laughs> couldn't get away from it. And th this is a summary of some of um, Adrian's work. The thing to note is the, the high levels of um, incompatibility that we see in the parental plants and in the wild hybrid from Mount Etna. But in UKS squalidus, we've got this low level of um, a, a fruit set of 0.29 on average per capitulum um, across the country. And if you multiply that up, with, a, with a, a plant producing, say, um, around some of the, the healthy plants produce about 100 capitula per year, and 100 with um, 80 florets, um, and you can get sort of 29 seeds per plant per year, which is not insignificant, um, even though that's it's still mainly self incompatible. So we think that's been a contributing factor to its success, this sort of flexibility in the self-incompatibility system. But also, um, when we surveyed the number of alleles across the country, as I said, they're very low compared to um, the, 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 the parents on Mount Etna. Um, we've identified up to seven alleles, or estimated seven alleles. We've identified six properly. But, um, and you can see here that there's more, far more S alleles in the uh, Sicilian populations than you get in, in, in UK as squalidus. And then we get the dominance effect here. So very high levels of dominance in, 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 in Senecio squalidus compared to these other species and also this has been inserted recently um, from uh, data from Senecio etnensis. And 
With codominance, you get incompatibility. Um, and with dominance, you get more compatibility. So we think that dominance may have been under selection in the very small UK founding populations. And um, that could have been important in the success of this plant reproductively in its spread um, across the, the country. And with those um, features of, 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 of um, pseudo-self compatibility, high levels of dominance, there's very little effect on comparative mate availability between Squalidus and the other Senecios, even though it's got remarkably fewer S alleles. Now I'll go on to um, some genomic insights. And we've done genomics at two levels. One is sequencing RNA. Um, so we look at the, um, all the RNA available, which gives you um, information about the genes expressed um, by the, 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 the various species. So we were able to compare gene expression in um, Senecio squalidus, its parents and um, hybrids on Etna. Uh, the first technique um, was very laborious. We now have um, next generation sequencing which can do it far more quickly. But what you can do with these sorts of comparisons is you can pick out differentially expressed genes and particularly um, genes that may be involved in local adaptation. And then you can apply evolutionary analyses to these sequences and pick out signatures of selection in those sequences. And that's what we've done for a number of uh, interesting genes. And so for the parents on Mount Etna, we've identified genes that are involved in DNA repair and UV protection that are particularly upregulated in high altitude um, Senecio ignensis. Then in the lower altitude um, Senecio chrysanthemifolius at low, level, low levels, very hot on um, Mount Etna, drought tolerance, cold tolerance. And interestingly, in Senecio squalidus, we've seen genes involved in sulfur metabolism being affected iron transport and flowering time, which crops up in these as, as well. So it may be that um, sulfur metabolism has been um, under some sort of selection in the UK where sulfur levels are much lower in the soils than on the volcanic soils of, of Mount Etna. So this sort of thing might have been important in the success of this plant in the UK. We've sequenced finally the finally sequenced the genome of, of Senecio squalidus to a, a, a very high resolution. And for those who, who like statistics about genomes, there's plenty summar, summarized here. But we've got 95% of our assembly in 10 longest scaffolds which equate to the 10 chromosomes that we see as the haploid number in, in squalidus. That equates to about 30,000, just over 30,000 genes. And 62% consists of repetitive elements. But the interesting thing here is that long blocks of, of parent-specific alleles extend over entire chromosomes, which suggests that the two genomes have been sort of um, stuck together quite, quite quickly with, with, with large areas conserved. And these have stabilized uh, the hybrid lineage um, during speciation. And then going back to the earlier study of, of James and Abbott with the molecular markers, the genome where we can find uh, species-specific marks within the hybrid genome, we find that those equate to about 72% chrysanthemifolius specific and 28% etnensis specific. 
and the chloroplast genome is most similar to Senecio Ignensis, suggesting that was the female in that partnership. Another extraordinary finding um, of that sequence was linkage group four, chromosome four, which shows high levels of syntony conservation across all the other Asteraceae genomes that have been sequenced so far, which is quite remarkable and, and not really seen before in other, in other plant species. And this will have been conserved potentially for between 40 to 50 million years. So there's something about chromosome 4 in Senecio and chromosome 2 in lettuce and chromosome 14 in helianthus sunflower that is really important for being a member of the Asteraceae, for being a daisy. And we're looking into what the genes are on this chromosome um, currently. We've also seen that um, when you look um, at, at, at non-coding neutral markers, um, you can separate using PCA, Senecio squalidus, very much from Chrysanthema folius and Ignensis, uh, and, and the hybrid and Ignensis sits here distinct from them. So Senecio squalidus is, is, is very distinct, so it's, it's, it's diverged quite a bit in terms of these sequences um, since it evolved. And this was picked up in an earlier uh, standard molecular marker study that we did um, back in the 2010-2011, um, published in 2013, where we showed that UK squalidus sat distinct from the um, markers in the um, Sicilian populations. So what, what, what is it that's made Senecio squalidus um, so distinct from its parents um, in, in, in Sicily? We looked with the aid of the current um, curator of the herbaria uh, at Oxford, Stephen Harris, into, in more detail at the, um, the herbarium specimens that, that occur at Oxford. And what we find is that um, most of the early material that was found at Oxford was primarily Senecio chrysanthema folius. Um, and the, the actual hybrid does not occur, does, is not found in those early records. So it seems that Senecio chrysanthema folius was growing in the Oxford Botanic Garden, but the hybrid wasn't. However, Bobart, the younger, was exchanging seeds with the Duchess of Beaufort at Badminton, who was a great plant collector of those um, early days. And when you look in the Duchess's herbarium, which is part of the Sloan Herbarium um, in, the, in the Natural History Museum, you can see that she was growing both, both parents. So Eatonensis here, a little bit of serration, suggesting there may be a little bit of Chrysanthema folius in it, but more or less that um, most of the characters in there confirm that to be um, fairly pure Senecio Ignensis, and she was growing Chrysanthema folius. And so Stephen Harris um, theorised and showed from other records um, this hypothesis that um, the seeds actually came to the Duchess of Beaufort of both parents via Sherard, um, via Cupani, another monk, botanical monk in Sicily. And possibly the hybridization may have taken place in her garden um, in the early part of the 1700s or late 1600s. And then material went to Bobart at Oxford. And then that's how Delenius got hold of it to send it to Linnaeus. 
So we tested this with some very deep um, transcriptomic genomic sequencing with um, probably the world's expert on uh, approximate Bayesian computation, which looks at the, the genome, interrogates genomes to, to, to get answers to, um, to historical problems and timings and chronologies, um, coalescence and all that sort of stuff. Mark Beaumont at Bristol. We used 74 transcriptomes from the different species to test two models. One, an Etna origin, with, with material then being moved to Oxford. So the hybridization took place here. Then the second model, the badminton model, was that the parents came to the UK and that's where the hybridization took place. And to cut a long story short, when you apply the models that, that Mark Beaumont and, and Bruno Navado um, generated, um, and tested them with the ABC um, statistics, we found 95% support for model two. Now this is a probability landscape here created as part of the model. And the areas of yellow are high probability of um, the, the model being correct and green are lower. And as you can see over here, the, 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 the data sit within the high probability um, landscape sectors here compared to this model, the Etna origin, where they sit towards the edges or even outside. So in summary, the statistical support suggests a UK hybridization as the origin of Oxford ragwort rather than the um, the accepted um, theory um, that it came as a hybrid from Mount Etna to the Oxford Botanic Garden. So maybe we should be thinking of the Oxford ragwort as a Gloucester ragwort. So thank you. Setting aside the really interesting result that suggests it's a, the Gloucester ragwort, is there anything on the slopes of Mount Etna that you would recognize as squalidus? I've looked many times. There, there, there are plants that we, we, Adrian and I, no doubt Richard and, and, and his, his um, co-workers have, have sort of bumped into and thought, yes, that, that really does look like squalidus. But... Then when you look in detail, particularly at the leaf coverings, the, 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 um, the glaucousness, the, the hybrids still seem to have quite a high level of the, what, what has come from the Eatonensis parent, whereas, whereas the, the native Senecio squalidus leaves do tend to be um, m more green, if you like. Um, but, but in those intermediates, there are definitely things that look like um, squalidus. You, it's probably a dumb question, but you had in one of your uh, sorry, you had in one of your slides um, samples from various parts of the UK with the markers present from each of the parents. Did I misunderstand that? That was the study that Richard. So, so in the absence of both of the parents, presumably, how does that happen? Well, how, how do you get more of one parent and less of another parent if the parents aren't right. there? Well, that's, that's, that, I was hoping someone would ask that. Um, <laughs> that what, what you have to, to think about is that um, at Oxford, the early records show that Bobart was growing chrysanthemifolius, primarily. Um, the Duchess was growing Chrysanthemifolius and Eatonensis, and there are clearly um, hybrids within her collection as well. We, we think that um, the hybrids went to Oxford from um, badminton, but the Eatonensis stayed in badminton. It's a very difficult thing to actually grow outside in the UK. 
Senecio Ignensis. So we think that what happened was that the, um, the hybrid went from Babington to Oxford, where there was a lot of chrysanthemifolius already growing, and they're freely um, fertile, interfertile. So there was introgression so from... Changes. Yes, yeah, so, so that's why you get this high proportion of chrysanthemifolius in the UK hybrid which you don't see in the, necessarily in the hybrid material on Etna. Thank you. Can I just emphasise one point? Yep. Um, and that is... The... Come up here with, with me, Richard, <laughs> then we can really do the double act. <laughs> Yeah, I, so that's I, great to have both on the stage now. Um, I just wanted to emphasise the fact that actually the hybrid, which, um, you know, Senecio squalidus, is incredibly variable in leaf shape. So you can go to the population in Ed Edinburgh and you will see a range of variation which almost stretches from Atnensis in certain characters to chrysanthemifolius in others. Mm. So um, I think when um, that, uh, you answered that last question, the indication was that this is a, a particular phenotype, you know, squalidus, but actually it's incredibly yeah. valuable. Yeah, that's a good point. And of course, that's what, um, what Druce uh, added in his, in his piece in the... In, in, in the, in the Oxfordshire flora as well. And yeah, that's a thanks, Richard. That's a good point. Thanks for the very nice talk. Um, you talked about the genome assembly and that the plastid genome comes from Ethnensis. Is that what you generally see in all squalidus individuals, or can it come from either? You would need to do a lot more sequencing because that, that um, is based on the chloroplast genome of just the one individual that we sequenced. So, we, 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 based on that bit of evidence, we would say that Senecio ignensis is most likely to be the female parent, but we need to sequence a whole lot more um, chloroplasts to um, really confirm that. <laughs> 